Hi, I apologize for the lighting and the sound, but I'm trying my best. Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Dive Stories with Patty Instructor Cat. Hi, if you're new, if you're not, welcome back. I'm so happy that you took the time to check out my channel. In today's video, I wanted to talk to you about something that I've been thinking about talking about for a few years now. Ever since I started this YouTube channel, I wanted to share stories about what has happened in my dive career and my dive adventures to kind of give you a better idea of what to expect if you enter the dive industry as a professional or if you're just a recreational diver. So as you can see from the title, today I'll be talking about the one time I witnessed a dive accident. I'm very blessed that in the eight years that I worked as a diving instructor, I only ever witnessed one scuba diving accident. There are friends of mine who have unfortunately witnessed more. I have friends who have witnessed deaths. I have read so many stories about incidents that have happened that I really count my blessings that none of my students have ever met a bad end. And that in many situations where there was a panicked diver or any kind of issue like that, I was able to identify the issue before it escalated to a true dive accident. So in today's video, I'll be talking to you about potentially one of the first ever scuba diving courses that I taught. It was an open water course, I believe, and it was in about 2014, so quite a few years ago now, and one of my students ended up in the hospital. Now I'm gonna tell you the whole story of um, from the start to finish. I'm obviously not going to disclose uh, the student's personal information, but let's just call her Jane. Jane was a woman in her 40s to 50s who really wanted to get her scuba diving license. She was very excited for the opportunity to get her diving ticket since her partner, I believe, bought it for her as a birthday present. It was something that she's dreamed of for a very long time. She had many friends and family who had been divers themselves, and she was very familiar with scuba diving as a whole. Many people in Australia grow up right next to the beach. Meech? They grow up right next to the beach, so they're very comfortable swimmers, they're familiar in the surf, and they spend a lot of their time in the ocean. Jane wanted to take her love of the ocean to go from on top of the water, on the surface, to underwater to be able to see the beauty that lies underneath. I was not the instructor which took her through the theory portion of the day. If you guys need a quick reminder, there's a day of theory in the open water course where you do different units and then you have to take an exam. There's a day in the pool where you practice 25 different skills. And then there's four open water dives which are usually done on a boat or off the beach if that's the case in your scenario. So I was taking over from one of my colleagues who had completed the first day of open water theory training. As I was saying, so I took over the second part of the training day, which is the day at the pool. The day began normal as any day at the pool. I woke up early. I had two of my dive masters or one of my dive masters there with me that day. They were helping me out in setting up the gear, bringing the gear from the van preparing it all around the pool and listening as I briefed our students. I believe we had a pretty big class that day. There was about seven people. Um, the paddy numbers is eight to one, but then if you have a dive master, you can add another two, I believe. So you can have 10 or then 12. In our dive shop, we would usually have around eight at the maximum. So Jane was one of these eight students. Her partner had actually come to support her and was sitting at the pool's edge, kind of on his phone or reading a book, just hanging out, not intervening with anything. So we started the day off by having our briefing. We would practice putting on and taking off our gear three times just to make sure it's really stuck in our students' minds and to kind of see what they remembered from their previous day when they first did their first setup and takedown of their gear. Everything was going well so far, and we proceeded to enter the pool. I think we did the giant stride entry, so you take a big step and you kind of drop down into the pool. Then we did the big OK or OK check. Everything was going good. As you guys know, if you would have done your open water course, one of the first skills that you do is your mask clear. This is because 
if you have a clear mask, you're going to have a much more comfortable time doing the rest of the skills. So it is crucial that you first learn how to clear your mask so then you can be comfortable for the duration of the course. Unfortunately, Jane had issues clearing her mask. Now, this is a very common problem. I'd say about one out of four of my students had some issue with clearing their mask. If you want a video about all the different ways I've seen students fail at clearing their mask, let me know because some of these are truly hilarious and unique. Jane was just experiencing what a lot of people experience when they're first underwater. It was feeling overwhelmed with the feeling of being underwater. You're confined, you're breathing from this strange breathing apparatus, there's bubbles going up either side of your face, and then you have this big mask on your face, which is kind of obstructing your vision. It's causing a little bit of pressure on your face and it stops your nose from being able to breathe. So a lot of people find this whole experience very strange, especially if they're not very familiar with snorkeling or in general wearing this kind of mask setup. So Jane was just struggling with clearing her nose. We would always practice pressing the top of the mask, look up towards the surface of the pool and exhaling through our nose. She kept trying, but every time she got water in her eyes, she would simply stand up. Now, we definitely encourage our students to not stand up when they're in the pool, just because in the real world, in the ocean, if a problem amounts, you can't just stand up and be out of the water. To make sure that you're diving safely, you actually have to take your time to exit the water or to ascend at a gentle rate. Therefore, even though she was in, you know, a meter of water and she was perfectly safe to stand up, we generally recommend people don't do that. So I got her to come back down and we tried again. Didn't work again. She would get really freaked out and stand up. So we had to have a little bit of a chat, you know, um, about why it's so important not to stand up, trying to solve the issue underwater. I was right there holding her, so my hand was on her shoulder, providing that physical reassurance and just trying to guide her through it. But for some reason, she could just not get this done. Anytime she got any water in her mask, she would freak out and stand up. Again, pretty common. Everyone has a different level of comfort when it comes to water. Many diving students their first time do not like water in their mask. I still don't like water in my mask. It makes me feel very vulnerable. So I completely understand this. While she was struggling with this, everyone else had already completed their mask clearing successfully. And I didn't want to hold up the whole class. So I decided, hey, we're going to move on to some of the next skills and then return back to the mask clearing skill. In PADI, you can actually graduate or you can get your dive certificate unless you successfully and with ease do all 25 skills. But some of them are, you know, a little bit more. So every five or 10 skills, we would kind of try to come back to this math skill and it was just not working. Jane was doing great in all the other skills in our air exchanges, in our, uh, in our hovering, in our uh, fin pivots, in, the proper surfacing, all of those went fine without a problem. It was just by the end of the first half of the day, we came out of the water and she told me that she was just feeling really stressed, overwhelmed, and that the wetsuit felt really tight. So I unzipped it a little bit, trying to give her some more breathing room, but she kept saying the wetsuit felt quite tight. Unfortunately, I think it was winter <laughs> at this time, so it was, was quite cold. So going uh, wetsuitless is not the best option since even Australian winters, which are quite mild, if you're in the water for six hours in a day, you can definitely get hypothermia. So we do always encourage people to have thermal protection. The wetsuit was the correct size for her, but again, people who are not used to wearing a wetsuit might feel overwhelmed with the feeling of a wetsuit because they are a little bit more constricting than a t-shirt or anything like that. So we unzipped it for her, uh, allowed some water to flush through and hoped that that would be okay. I saw that it was really stressing her out uh, and that she was feeling really bad about failing 
to do this first skill, even though I repeatedly told her that it is not a big deal, that we can take as long as she needs to practice this skill, that we can keep trying in the shallow pool, we can practice just with our face in the water like this when we're snorkeling, that one of my dive masters would happily keep demonstrating it for her, uh, and that, you know, we had all day, and even if we didn't manage to do it that day, it wasn't a problem. It's perfectly normal for every student to have a different learning curve and to master some skills much faster than other students and vice versa. Lunch began, so we had all de-geared, everyone was going to get their sandwiches, or something, she had gone to sit with her partner with her meal. I was hanging out with my dive masters at the time and preparing for the second half of the day. Suddenly, one of my dive masters, so I had two, so the second one came running to me and told me, Jane is not okay. Actually, I can't remember the exact words he said. Something's wrong with Jane, you have to come see Jane. I, of course, dropped what I was doing immediately and walked quite briskly towards where she was sitting. Didn't want to run because we're at a pool trying to be good examples to everyone around. And once I got there, she was clutching her chest and she told me she couldn't breathe. And this was uh, not a great situation. So she was really struggling to breathe and her partner was starting to get really worried. So we sat down with her and we tried to talk her through everything and she just kept repeating that she just did so bad and she was such a failure and she felt horrible. So we tried to be reassuring, but clearly this wasn't helping. Uh, so within a minute, I told my other dive master to go inform the pool staff if we could get a first aid kit and start that protocol. As soon as he left, I remained with her. We kept talking, he walked back, ran back potentially at this point and said they have a whole first aid room so we could move Jane to there. And they actually had a qualified first responder on staff who was able to continue with diagnostics as they potentially have to call the ambulance. So we moved her there. She couldn't breathe. She was still struggling to breathe. So we made the decision to call the ambulance. This was all within a span of two, three minutes or longer. I don't know now when you're heightened emotionally, I feel like time kind of bleeds. But I do remember that um, in that moment, I didn't know what was wrong. All I knew she was struggling to breathe. And from my perspective, it was due to emotional stress of feeling like she hadn't done a very good job. I remember speaking to my peers, uh, even getting on the phone with my boss to let him know what happened. And, you know, he very calmly said, you've done everything right. There's nothing else you could have done. I am sure she's going to be fine. There is nothing to worry about. The first uh, response ambulance arrived by this time. They got into the room with her and closed her out. And at this point, there was nothing else we could do. We went back to our other students that one of the dive masters was with the whole time to make sure they were all okay and kind of just give them a little rundown of what happened to tell them they shouldn't be afraid. First, first response ambulance is here, so Jane was being well taken care of. Um, after a little bit of time, the ambulance people came up to me and told me that yes, she needed to be taken to the hospital. I believe they did give her some form of sedative, which did calm her down, but they wanted to take her to the hospital for a checkup just in case. So she left in the ambulance. The partner thanked us for responding as quickly as we did, and he went off with Jane as well. We were all a bit shaken up, but we finished off the second half of the course. The other students did great. We finished everything up, packed everything up, and went home. Now. Jane was fine, but it turns out that the doctor actually found a pre-existing heart condition that did not come up on just the normal dive medical. So if you guys don't know, if you are in a particular risk group, which is over a certain age, or have a history of other illnesses, you may need to do a dive medical before doing your open water course. This is because pre-existing heart conditions, asthma, or, or other medical conditions, which like epilepsy, if kick in 
underwater can, can cause drowning and death. Therefore, it is very important that you do not lie on your medical questionnaire and that you tell your instructor the truth about all your pre-existing conditions. I've heard of another story of where a mother lied to the medical questionnaire team and ended up passing away in front of her daughter because she said no to something she knew she had. So devastating um, all around. And I have friends who witnessed that. And it's, that's another story. But Jane was all good, but turns out she had this pre-existing heart condition that she would have actually not found out about if it weren't for this situation. So she was extremely grateful. Unfortunately, Jane wasn't able to ever get her dive ticket. So she is not a diver today, but she did try her best. She did great in theory. And I'm glad that we managed to intervene <laughs> or managed to deal with the situation as best as we could to ensure that it didn't escalate and she wasn't actually in danger. And that all of this, of course, didn't happen out in the ocean when we were deep underwater. So she was online, she was safe, she was with people who cared about her, and uh, the hospital took very good care of her. I still think about that incident a lot. I still uh, spent a lot of time thinking about if I should have acted differently at the start, if I should intervened, if I should have gotten her out of the pool earlier, if I should have just given her an even bigger wetsuit. There's so many questions that you ask yourself after every single one of these incidents or even potential incidents that really help you grow as a person and as an instructor. I'm extremely grateful to the dive masters I had on that day. They did a fantastic job. They stayed very calm and provided me with that support. <laughs> I was 19 years old, I believe, and I was the highest ranked diver uh, there. So it did feel like a lot of pressure and, you know, all of that on me. And I was quite young, but everything ended up well. Jane sent us all a thank you and she is doing good as far as I know now. That's my little story time of, uh, uh, the only dive accident that I have witnessed. I had to fill out an emergency incident report form, send it off to Patty, and of course, you know, reiterate this to them. Uh, and dive masters had to do the same, but yeah, we were very lucky that nothing really bad happened and the outcome was positive. I cannot imagine the pain and the stress and the fear if I was involved in a more serious incident, but I'm grateful that my training uh, and my peers and my, uh, you know, <laughs> abilities were to deal with this situation relatively calmly and uh, provide a positive resolution. So even though a lot of people may think the medical questionnaire is not a big thing or that diving is a very safe sport, bad things can happen and that is why it is important to be as honest as you can, stay as healthy as you can, take care of yourself, take care of the people around you, see and look if there's something going wrong with other people in your dive group or your dive buddy so we can potentially help prevent any more sad stories from happening. If you guys want to hear any more dive stories, please let me know things you'd be interested in hearing if you want to hear me talk about dive accidents a little bit more. Uh, I would be happy to do that and do some research about them that I haven't been involved in and kind of tell you guys the story of what happened and, you know, uh, potentially share what the advice has been given to try and avoid these kinds of accidents in the future. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, it would mean the world to me if you joined the family. So subscribe, like it, uh, I also have a podcast if you want to check it out, the Ocean Pancake Podcast, where I publish ocean conservation and sustainability messages and interviews with incredible marine scientists and conservationists from around the world.